Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name's David Bomford. I'm the um, uh, curator of European art here in the Museum of Fine Arts and one of the curators of the Tudors to Windsor's exhibition upstairs. And uh, that exhibition, that wonderful exhibition, is entering its last week. Um, so uh, go as many times as you can in this uh, coming week. And uh, to celebrate the end of the exhibition, we have two extraordinary lectures uh, next weekend and this weekend. Um, and next weekend, uh, next Saturday at the same time as this, uh, we have Dr. Tanya Cooper, who is the um, Director of Collections of the uh, UK National Trust. And she is going to be talking about making monarchy, portraiture, power, and pride. So don't miss that lecture. Uh, but this afternoon, we have uh, another wonderful lecture uh, to be given by my friend and colleague, Dr. Alexandra Losky, um, who is curator of the Royal Pavilion in Brighton and lecturer in art history at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. Um, Alexandra was born and brought up in Germany, and she read linguistics and English at Humboldt University in Berlin. And she then uh, moved and, uh, to work in England in 1997. And she's been working at the University of Sussex, uh, which incidentally was my university, um, since 1999, uh, where she teaches in the Department of Art History. Um, the subject of her doctoral thesis, which she got in uh, 2014, was the use of color and the application of color theory in, the, in Brighton Pavilion. And you're going to see some stunning slides of Brighton Pavilion later in this lecture. Um, and since uh, 2015, she has been the curator of Brighton Pavilion. Um, she's written a great deal uh, on color, and she has a book on color coming out in uh, uh, this year, in spring of this year, uh, called Color, A Visual History. Uh, but she has just published um, a, a book about the moon uh, with a co-author, uh, the um, uh, um, science, art, and culture of, of uh, studies of the moon. And incidentally, there's a, an eclipse of the moon tomorrow night, which, um, so she, Alexandra has been telling me all about it. So you have to get your telescopes out and study the moon tomorrow evening. But meanwhile, we have a wonderful lecture uh, based on our uh, exhibition upstairs, Talent, Wit, Buffoonery, George the Fourth's Life, Loves, and Taste. You're in for scandal, you're in for spectacle, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Alexandra Losky. Thank you, David. It sounds as if I have three lives, I don't know. <laughs> so, it's, uh, uh, so thank you so much for inviting me to give this lecture, and I'm hoping to bring to live my office which you see here, see here on the slide, and of course, as a large uh, print in the wonderful exhibition upstairs. Um, it's a bit unnerving giving this lecture in the United States, but uh, I shall try my best. And uh, I will tell you, what, what, what I mean by loves, really, is uh, not just the many women that George had. So you get a few of those, but really, I also want to tell you a little bit about what he loved, um, our George. And uh, here we have, and you have, you have this portrait of him in your exhibition, which is rather wonderful because it's so restrained, and it's not something we usually associate with George the Fourth. It is so restrained because it's essentially a sketch, but we see him here um, in 1814. So this is the height of the Regency, and I'll explain that term in a minute. Uh, we see George here with tousled hair. He wants to look like the romantic poet Byron. He does a little bit, but you know he rather loses his shape um, quite early in life. But it is it's a it's a, it's a lovely picture of him. And of course, I work with him in his in one of his palaces. But strangely uh, and curiously, a lot of people don't actually know where he fits in, where he is. And I often wondered why, and I, th and I think it's because of the people who are sort of, you know, who uh, who are, you know, who come before him and after him. 
And you in particular, of course, will know a lot about King George III, his father, who ruled for a very long time. He's one of the longest reigning monarchs in British history from 1760 to 1820. And uh, he's well known, or should we say famous, for two things, for <coughs> losing the American colonies. And, of course, he is a so-called uh, mad King George. He suffers from bouts of mental illness throughout his life and that's been sort of turned into films. So we know him very well and we know George's niece, not direct successor because between George, my George, I call him George IV, and Victoria comes his brother William who's even less unknown than my George. Um, but he is sort of overshadowed by Queen Victoria, who we associate, a you know, with her we associate a whole century, the whole of the 19th century, which is of course not true. She, she came to the throne in um, 1837. So, our, so there are these two big figures framing our George. But our George has an enormous, had an enormous impact on especially cultural life. And that is almost forgotten in certain circles. And I think it's partly because of these overpowering figures to the left and the right of him, but also because he was so incredibly naughty. And, you know, in times, in, you know, in, in hard times, and we both live in hard times at the moment, uh, it is not quite acceptable to talk about debauchery in somebody who spent, who spent a lot of money, more money than he had, actually. So, but let me bring him to life and let me sort of explain about what he was all about. Um, he didn't get on with his father and his father was the, well, he was George the Third. He was the third of the Hanoverian kings. The House of Hanover came to the English throne in 1714 after the last of the Stuart monarchs, Queen Anne, so beautifully portrayed by Olivia Colman, in the uh, film The Favourite. She died without an heir uh, in 1714. And because of the act of settlement, which was uh, to secure the Protestant line of succession in Britain, the nearest Protestant king with a right to the throne of England was King George I of Hanover. So they shipped him in from Germany. Uh, his son was George the III the second, and you think that's going to be easy, George one, two, three, and four. Then it should have been Frederick, but Frederick died before he became uh, king. And then uh, it was his son, George the third, who um, was the first one to be born in this, in this country, in England. Okay, so that's him, that's the father. And um, he married, uh, without ever having met her, he married um, uh, uh, Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitz They were introduced to each other on the day of their wedding, and it worked. They liked each other. It was, to all intents and purposes, a successful marriage. And whereas my George didn't get on terribly well with his father for several reasons, he had quite a good relationship with his mother. And here we see uh, little George, aged four or five, uh, actually, three or four. Uh, here he is. Here's my George. Here he is. This is uh, little George in, with his mother, um, Charlotte, in what we now know as Buckingham Palace, but this is, it, it, was, it was then called Queen's House or Buckingham House. And here he is dressed up like a sort of Greco-Roman soldier, and here's his younger brother, Frederick, in sort of Turkish attire. And she was incredibly influential on his taste because look at what's all around them. Look at these Chinese nodding figures here in the background. However, a very, very difficult relationship with his father. Now, Charlotte and George III had 15 children. And you may think that's enough to secure the line of succession. Well, it wasn't quite so. But here they are painted um, by uh, Reynolds. Uh, not all of them are in the picture, two of them are not there. So here is George the third, here is his wife Charlotte, here is our George. So he becomes George the fourth of England. And um, we know him, although he only reigned for 10 years, from 1820 to 1830. As I said, he was extremely influential on the arts and on style and on taste. He liked fashion. 
He liked women, he liked dancing, he liked collecting things. I'll show you a few examples of that. But he is known, within a week, he becomes, after his birth in 1762, he becomes the Prince of Wales. So he's the Prince of Wales from pretty much his birth until 1811. In 1811, his father, George III, has another bout of illness. He's declared mad, it is probably uh, the blood illness porphyria that causes these, these bouts of so-called madness. And he is unable to rule the country. It's quite literally locked away. He gets locked away at Windsor Castle. And his son, George, is put in charge. And that's, so the regency is declared. And um, this is a crucial time. So George now has all the power, my George. It is also the height of the Napoleonic War, so it's not an easy time. But being in charge with his father he doesn't get on with, sort of locked away, it makes him, you know, one of the most powerful men in Europe. And then in that regency proper, in those nine years between 1811 until King George III dies in 1820, Napoleon is defeated. So then George really has, you know, he, you know, he is the most powerful man in Europe. Um, so that's sort of in, in a picture here in the middle, that's from the Regency, and you see him there in full marshal's uniform. On the left here you see his interest in fashion, this is fashionable young George, and he's quite good looking as a young man, and he's very fit and he sort of rides from London to Brighton in a day and back. In 1820 King George III dies, and uh, George is finally king, he's finally king. He's also very large by that stage. So on the right here you have the coronation portrait of which we have a copy in the Royal Pavilion. Now, his coronation uh, takes place in 1821. It takes a long time to organize it for various reasons. And it is the most expensive coronation ceremony ever. Uh, this is just one impression of it. This is not in the Abbey. So he's, he's, he's crowned in Westminster Abbey. Um, this is the banquet that follows the coronation. This is in Westminster Hall. So his coronation robe alone, and this really is, this tells you about his tastes and his loves. Just his coronation robe cost 24,000 pounds. He had a 27 feet train. He nearly, he nearly fainted under the weight of his train. He had a new crown made by Rundle Bridge and Rundle, his jewelers. The crown cost 12,000 and something pounds. Um, in today's money, that would be about 62,000 pounds. And that's just the crown, not the jewels. He has to rent the jewels. <laughs> he has to rent the jewels and uh, has to give them all back. He also apparently possibly buys the Hope Diamond for this occasion. It's not confirmed, but you get a sense of, you know, what he likes. He likes pomps, pomp and circumstances. So there's much to dislike about him. He's, he's spending public, partly spending public money um, when he shouldn't. And, uh, you know, in, in 1784, and this is sort of, you know, three years after he comes of age, so when he's 23, um, his, uh, his treasurer and secretary says to him, it is with grief and vexation that I now see your Royal Highness totally in the hands and at the mercy of your builder, your upholsterer, your jeweler, and your tailor. So that's the young prince having amassed incredible debts of, you know, uh, in today's money, about 60 million pounds. That's just one member of the royal family. So no wonder he was unpopular with uh, the general public. So you've seen a few of the images that are all commissioned by George himself. Quite a vain man. Okay, let's look at um, pictures that were created of him by other people. Okay? And um, <laughs> George was fortunate stroke unfortunate to, to live in an age, in the great, great age of British caricatures. There was, you know, very little that could stop caricaturists uh, sort of producing these images. And it's, and they're still going on today, political cartoons, politi 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 uh, polit well, political caricatures. So compare these two. You have this in the exhibition. This is a little miniature of him showing him in 1792. And on the left here is one of the great James Gilray caricatures. And we see, probably slightly exaggerated, but really what he's getting up to. 
uh, the buttons of his britches and his waistcoats are popping off because he's so obese already. You know, this is the young prince. This is the young pr uh, prince of Wales. And his coat of arms, for example, and you can read these like, you know, uh, the iconography is quite sort of interesting once you know what you're looking for. Here, coat of arms, knife and fork. <laughs> he's, he's eaten an entire ham. Uh, two empty, nearly empty carafes of wine, six or seven more here under the table. Uh, he's, he's picking his teeth with a fork. Uh, bills from gambling, bills for, venere for medication for venereal diseases and all of that here. An overflowing chamber pot. So this is, the public Im is one of the public images of the prince. So uh, you, you see, I'll give you a few more of these <laughs> because they're a nice little contrast to the commissioned official portraits. So he was fodder for the cartoonist. He was fodder for the press because of his excesses. Um, another, yeah, one of his loves was women. He just loves women. And uh, uh, the Times in the late 1780s says about him that at all times he would prefer a girl and a bottle to politics and a sermon. And he was characterized throughout his life by gluttony, drunkenness, and gambling by the press. So what do we have here? It's another one of his loves. It's a woman. It's Mariah Fitzherbert, the wonderful Mariah Fitzherbert. And it is horses and the equivalent to sports cars. This is a phaeton. And uh, he is, uh, you know, he's overturning and he's falling into the buttocks of Mariah Fitzherbert. So Mariah Fitzherbert um, is, is described here as the imaginary bride. And George had a lot of mistresses, lovers, and they tended to be slightly older women. Quite a lot of them were, were sort of previously married were, or were widowed. And Mariah Fitzherbert uh, is a highly respected, twice widowed Catholic woman who he falls in love with. She's slightly older than him. And they meet in the early uh, 1780s when he's still in his, well, he's in his early 20s. And he falls madly, madly in love with her. And you have, of course, a much, much nicer portrait than this caricature of her in the exhibition. I'm glad she's there right next to him. Uh, a formidable woman and uh, twice widowed and a Roman Catholic. He chases her. He you know, declares his love for his undying love for her. He wants to marry her. And of course, that is not allowed. It is not allowed. However, he makes such a fuss, <laughs> despite Mariah's sort of, you know, disappearing, fleeing to the continent. Uh, he pretends at one point to kill himself, to stab himself, to put pressure on her. And she comes back. And they do actually get married. They do actually get married um, in 1785. Now, in the eyes of the Catholic Church, that is a marriage. In the eyes of the Anglican Church, it was never a legal marriage because, uh, remember the Act of Settlement, the king or future king of England is not allowed to marry a Roman Catholic. And also, George had not asked his father permission to, uh, to marry. So, however, they are married. And, you know, she remains the love of his life. And um, they have to split up at some point. They keep coming back together. Uh, he is married with uh, a picture of her in a locket. So he's, you know, in the, in the crypt at Windsor um, in St. George's Chapel with a picture of Mariah Fitzherbert on his chest. The, the other one of those lockets recently came up for sale at Christie's. So on the right here, you see the one that belonged to Mariah Fitzherbert. And it sold for something ridiculous, £350,000, I think. We couldn't buy it, and you know it was too difficult to do that. But it's a it's a great story, and she she was you know a much loved formidable woman, and considered herself married to George, of course. So there's much to dislike about George, but there's also much to like. And what makes him stand out for me is that he was one of the two greatest collectors and patrons of the art in British royal history. The only one that compares to him is, of course, Charles I. Here he is, and that's here. No, 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 that's not here, right? That's not here. You have another one of uh, Charles I with Henrietta uh, Maria. I think they're separate. And those two are the first of serious collectors. And they bring to, this, they, they bring to England pictures that are sensual, that are colorful. So they bring, of course, Van Dyck 
to the English court. Uh, just to give you a few examples, this is what Charles I does. You know, incredibly sensual, sometimes erotic pictures that really, uh, you know, had not been seen in, in the royal collection before. Here's the wonderful Cupid and Psyche. Uh, this is the kind of thing Charles goes and buys as a young man when he goes to the continent. You know, sexy pictures, you know, wonderful. And he buys this from the, from the Mantua collection and uh, if you make it to England or maybe some of you have been this is in Hampton Court and you have a picture of Hampton Court in the exhibition here don't miss don't miss Mantegna's The Triumph of Caesar uh, it is you know, be, you know strangely luckily this never left the collection because of course Cromwell dispersed almost the entire collection of Charles the first after he was beheaded but these uh, even Cromwell uh, was hanging on to the infanta. So this is what Charles I does, but we lose Charles's collection because, you know, he is, um, he is executed and Cromwell takes over. But George is really the one that compares to him. And just to give you a few examples of what he collects and what he commissions, um, he uh, gives us the greatest complete sort of collection of uh, paintings by George Stubbs, partly because of his love of horses, and he is just one. He loves, he loves everything, really. He loves anything that's colorful and garish and, you know, opulent. Uh, he loves porcelain, uh, particularly Sèvres porcelain, very colorful, of course. And he loves gold. Noth hardly anything gets away from his obsession with gilding which causes us a few headaches in the Royal Pavilion, by the way. So here are just one pieces from the Grand Service. Um, everything, all of this, of course, silver gilt. So you get a sense of, you know, uh, what he likes. But he's also very good on paintings. Of course, with help, he has people who advise him and who point out certain things. So just two examples of two of the great greatest paintings in the Royal Collection. Here's Rembrandt's Agatha Bass, wonderful. And there's also another Rembrandt, the shipbuilder, and his wife. And what, what, what is so interesting about George is that he seems selfish, but I don't think he was entirely selfish. He was self-obsessed, certainly, and lived in a bubble. But uh, he thinks on a bigger scale, and, and he was aware of the great loss of Charles I's collection, and says at one point that he was trying to form you know, this new collection, not just for his own pleasures, but for, um, also for the public taste. And he has done that. He has done that. Um, and what we sometimes forget, or what not everybody knows, is that he was also a great builder king. Uh, so you think of Buckingham Palace, but very few people know that Buckingham Palace, which existed before him um, as Queen's House or Buckingham House, was ex greatly extended by him. He commissioned John Nash. And this is the, the garden front, which you rarely see. And then uh, the other front you don't see at all anymore because it was, you know, built up by um, by Queen Victoria. That is George the Fourth. That is George. Uh, so that's Buckingham Palace. He has his own palace, uh, not far from Buckingham Palace, and that's Carlton House, where he re really plays with interior design. It's where he tries out many, many things that we will later see in the Royal Pavilion and in other palaces. I, I can tell someone spotted it. There is that Rembrandt I showed you just a minute ago. There it is. Yeah, it's a great lost palace. He had it pulled down himself in the 1820s. So he's a man of great taste. He spends a lot of money. He doesn't care how much he spends. He keeps asking for more money. And that gets him into trouble. So by uh, his late 20s, he had amassed you know, you know, debts of 60 million pounds. Something needed to be done. By the 1790s, he had been quite happily living with Maria Fitzherbert. He was urged by Parliament and his parents to marry and procreate. So marry an, an acceptable, suitable, virginal Protestant princess, because Maria Fitzherbert was not acceptable. And they find one for him. She gets shipped in uh, <laughs> from, uh, from Braunschweig, Brunswick, his first cousin, Caroline of Brunswick. And as with his parents, really, they had never met before. Uh, she was sent a miniature so in that style. Um, he supposedly was also given a picture of, of his future bride. They meet, they get introduced to each other in 1795, and it is hate at first sight. Um, 
She says about him that he is much fatter than the picture uh, would let her believe. And he says of her that she smells badly, she has no sense of personal hygiene, um, and asks for a glass of brandy. You know, pray fetch me a glass of brandy. He is drunk at the wedding, which takes place the following day. He is also drunk in the wedding night, during the wedding night. However, um, somehow they managed to conceive a child. And this child is born nine months after the wedding. And that child is uh, only a girl, but it'll do for now. It'll do for now. It is Charlotte. And Charlotte, here's another one of those cartoons. This is, you know, shortly after Princess Charlotte's birth. Here we have the feuding parents. Here is the little princess. Um, he's kicking over. He's in a rage and he's kicking over um, the table. Uh, shortly after Charlotte is born, he makes a will. He writes a will in which he so, you know, leaves something for his baby daughter, but he leaves everything else to Mariah Fitzherbert. Yeah? In the background here, we have Lord Jersey. And Lord Jersey is, is uh, you know, calling uh, George, saying, please come and help yourself to my wife, Lady Jersey, who's sort of spread eagle on a sofa here. Yeah. So all is not well uh, in that marriage. And soon after, <laughs> soon after Charlotte is born, uh, they separate. Uh, poor Charlotte grows up with, you know, as, as this sort of pawn between her feuding parents. They never get divorced, which is quite interesting, because it gives Caroline uh, quite a lot of leverage. Because if you're not divorced, it is possible you could have another baby, you could have another child. That child, if it's a boy, would of course overtake the Princess Charlotte in the line of succession. But everybody knew those two weren't together anymore. So Caroline, who was for a time living in Blackheath, a completely different part of London, and later in Italy, was quite openly having affairs and lovers. And uh, cartoonists obviously have a field day with that. She would sometimes put uh, a pillow under her skirt and appear in public. Uh, you know, had she had another child, that child would have technically been in line um, to the throne. So a really bad match. However, the public is pretty fed up with this feuding and with their, with their behavior in general. George and, and Mariah's, and George and, um, and Caroline's behavior. So all the hope is on Charlotte, that angelic princess. And you see how she's portrayed, even in the very early days. There's the lion, there's all the insignia of royalty. There's the doves of peace there at the top. She's the, she's the darling, she's, you know, people, people love this princess. She's boisterous, she's a bit like a rough diamond. She has a lot of her mother and her father, and when you read her letters, you can tell she was sharp. She was sharp. She knew exactly what her parents were about. She knew they were both as bad as each other. Uh, here, just out of interest, is uh, a portrait of uh, Princess Charlotte. And she clearly has George's features. She has her father's features here. But look at the imagery. So this is done by Mariah Cosway, and it's actually a portrait of Caroline of Brunswick with her daughter, making that, ve that visual statement of being you know, connected to the throne of England. So here's Britannia, here's the lion, uh, here is the next, well, the second in line to the throne you know, uh, with her mother. And they're all linked. Look how they're visually all linked. It's Caroline making a bit of a point here, really. So the princess grows up, and she's as I don't know, she's as wild and daring as her father, and he realizes that. So as a teenager, she falls in love with, some, you know, with, with people. Her mother encourages her to, to have you know, supposed affairs, and this could become a bit dangerous. So here she is dancing with the Duke of Devonshire, and the alarm bells are ringing um, uh, in her father's head, and he decides to try and marry her off quite, quite quickly, because she's such a flirt. She's such a fun-loving person. So they try and uh, uh, marry her off uh, <laughs> to um, a Dutch prince. And um, Charlotte, being quite so feisty, initially agrees to this engagement. So they are engaged. And then she realizes that you know, uh, he is actually quite a nasty person, and possibly an alcoholic. And she writes to Parliament, and she goes public and says, I will not marry this ugly, spider-legged, nasty Dutchman. 
So, and she calls off the engagement. It's quite a thing to do. So people are worried about uh, what's going to happen. But all is well in the end because she falls in love with Leopold of um, uh, <laughs> saxe coburg um, a dashing a dashing German prince without much money, but he has other credentials. Yeah, and he. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it's a rather unflattering picture of of um, of Charlotte. Yeah. So this is this is Charlotte. This is her. This is <laughs> this is her grandmother. Uh, so, uh, and here is um, here is uh, George, already sort of you know quite in quite ill health. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Queen Charlotte is saying to her, don't be afraid, although he's so terribly large. And uh, she's actually quite pleased and said, oh my God, you know, bless me, he is but he's two yards long. So it takes a little bit of convincing, but at the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, uh, the, the engagement is announced, is, is declared of those two, Leopold of uh, uh, saxe coburg and Princess Charlotte. And it is a love match. They get married at, um, at Carlton House in London, in a, as was usual, quite a sort of intimate ceremony. Um, and they uh, move into a house uh, called Claremont in Isha. And they are, and here's the wedding dress, which we had in the Royal Pavilion recently. It's one of the earliest surviving royal wedding dresses, absolutely beautiful, woven with silver thread. And um, they, you know, they are the darlings of the London scene, although they don't like sort of, you know, the, you know, the display of opulence in the same way that uh, George does. So people love them. It's a wonderful, you know, uh, story with an apparent happy ending of this marriage. And notice how she's wearing flowers, roses in her hair. She is referred to as um, the Coburg Rose, the English Rose. And uh, here she is on the right. She, is, she, miscarriages, she, uh, she miscarries a couple of times. And then she is pregnant again in early 1817, a year after the wedding. And she carries the child to term. And here she is just before giving birth uh, in November. She goes into labor on the 3rd of November. Um, 1817, and she only has men in attendance. There is no midwife. There are accoucheurs and doctors, but there's no woman. Leopold is there uh, at their house in, in Isha. And it's a terrible, terrible labor. It lasts 50 hours. 50 hours, and she gives birth to a stillborn baby boy uh, who looks gorgeous apart from, you know, having clearly suffocated um, in the womb. And she is quite composed about this. And of course, that boy would have been the next in line to the throne. Uh, he's never named, by the way. And all seems well. And then a few hours later, Charlotte herself is feeling dizzy. She throws up. She is sick. And she dies in the early hours of the 6th of November. So that was, it sent shock waves through the country. And uh, here is her funeral procession, which was very dramatic, so taking place at Windsor. Uh, the baby, because it was stillborn uh, and not baptized, could not be buried initially with her, but was lowered into the crypt later on in complete silence. But people went into a frenzy of mourning, not just George himself, her father, but of course, poor, poor Leopold, you know, having lost um, his wife. But the nation went into mourning. Uh, the shops were selling out of black cloth. Uh, shops were closed for, uh, for a long time. And women were wailing in the streets. And all sorts of memorabilia was being produced. Uh, so people were bemoaning the fact that they had lost that lovely, lovely princess at the age of 21. And they call her, not quite the people's princess, but they call her the English Rose. And you know where this comes, where this happens again, of course, in a similarly, in similarly tragic circumstances. So we see all these things being published and, and produced um, in the aftermath of her death. Here we see her going to heaven, and the baby is carried to heaven too. She's receiving the heavenly crown. Um, and from this, the, and this inspired one of the greatest funereal monuments uh, in Britain. This is um, M.C. Wyatt's um, monument to Princess Charlotte, paid for by the general public. Uh, but erected in, uh, in George, St. George's Chapel in Windsor, at Windsor Castle. The nickname for this is the Laundry, by the way. 
<laughs> it has just been cleaned. It is, it's, it's, it's a very spectacular monument, if you ever get to see it um, in St. George's Chapel. So what a tragic... So and of course, that was it. No heir to the throne. You know, that was the only child George ever had, legitimate child George ever had. And not just that, <laughs> it was the only grandchild, legitimate grandchild that George III, who was of course still king, uh, and, uh, and Queen Charlotte had. Imagine 15 children, no legitimate grandchild. So they very quickly had to marry off all their middle-aged sons and daughters trying to produce an heir, which gives us this wonderful cartoon, the Homburg Waltz, you know, where all these middle-aged uh, you know, people are trying to find partners and quickly produce babies. So here in the corner you have uh, Queen Charlotte again saying, it's a bit late in the evening to start waltzing, but you better try. Um, so, uh, so Charlotte died, dies at the end of, of 1817. This is going on in 1818. Quick, 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 produce babies. In 1819, four royal babies are born. Four, okay? So what we see here in 1819 is the various dukes with their offspring. Here on the left, I'll probably get the names right now, Duke of Clarence, I think, they have, they have, they have just lost a baby uh, soon after birth. This is the Duke of Cambridge with a newborn baby boy, and they're quite happy because they're doing well. This boy could be, you know, the future King of England, but here's the Duke of Kent. Here's the Duke of Kent, and he comes before him. So uh, this here, this baby in the womb here, is Queen, the future Queen Victoria. So she was born in 1819. So Queen Victoria was only conceived because Princess Charlotte died in childbirth. We would not even have had her. Had Charlotte survived, we would probably have had a Charlottian age instead of a Victorian age. And Queen Victoria would not even have been born. So it's quite a thought, isn't it? Yeah. Meanwhile, George, oh, George was still alive. So here is the future Queen Victoria. And here she is uh, visiting the Royal Pavilion, having just become Queen of England. So you see it there in the background. And uh, now, so that was the sad part of the lecture. And now I would like to invite you to come with me into my office. All right? <laughs> Shall we look at the Royal Pavilion? So, this is it. This is probably the most romantic building in England. Um, it is the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, built entirely for and by George IV. And um, this gives you an idea what it looks like. <laughs> Now, uh, it is in the centre of Brighton. It is surrounded by the municipal structures and all that. It has a, quite a small park around it. And it is, of course, an extravaganza. It is an exotic, you know, orientalised building. Uh, the ultimate party palace or pleasure domes, as we call them in German, and Lustschloss. And uh, he was much mocked and criticised for this. It obviously costs a lot of money. Here he is. Uh, you know, throwing a tantrum because, you know, he can't get any more baubles for his Chinese temple. It looks Indian on the outside and Chinese on the inside. But uh, what brought him to Brighton in the first place? Brighton's on the south coast of England, so an hour's train journey from London, but trains weren't around yet. It, took, it would take about four hours by horse-drawn coach. Why Brighton? Well, Brighton was a seaside resort. It was a place where you could go with an excuse that it was good for your health. And it was quite handy that there, were all, there was also a lot of gambling uh, to do. There was a race course, and you could watch the ladies being dipped into the water. So naturally, the young George, Prince of Wales, goes down to Brighton after he had turned 21 and enjoys you know, everything that Brighton has to offer. And then quite quickly decides to spend more time there and build himself a little pavilion by the sea. He never calls it a palace. So this is it. It's by Henry Holland. It's a neoclassical, elegant, quite a small building, sort of symmetrical. And look at the colours. It's painted blue and buff. And blue and buff were also the colours of the opposition, the political opposition, which he sided with because it was, you know, the opposite to what his father was supporting. So uh, the Whigs, basically. And I understand there's also a connection with, uh, with American history as well, blue and buff revolutionaries and all that. I didn't know that until yesterday. But here we have the first marine pavilion in the 1780s, looking quite tame. Okay. So what happens? Well, 
what happens is George goes, goes oriental, he goes exotic. And first, in the early years of the 1800s, he builds himself this. This is the most tremendous, it's a fantastic structure. It is a domed building, and at the time, the largest domed structure in the country, apart from St. Paul's Cathedral. And what's it for? For his horses. These are stables. And here's the inside view of the stables. Okay, And this really, it overpowers not just the whole of Brighton, but also the, royal, the, the pavilion. So he then thinks, well, I've got to catch up with my horses. And he has great ideas. And he goes oriental on the inside first in the royal pavilion. And then he hires, and this happens in the regency, when he has power, access to more money, nobody turns him down. He hires the star architect of the time, John Nash. And he says, John, please orientalize my little pavilion by the sea in Brighton. And he does it. He obliges. And this is how he does it. He adds these two amazing rooms, wings, to the, uh, to the north and the south. But what's going on in the middle? That's still the original building. How do you get from this to this? Okay? You don't pull it down. You use a modern building material called cast iron. You know, we see that later a lot in, sort of in, the, in railway uh, um, infrastructure. But this, is, this was quite daring. So all these minarets that you see and the big bulbous domes, they're all based on wood and cast iron structures. And you see it here in this cross section. Everything that's blue is cast iron. That's how you make a building on the English coast look oriental. Yeah. Uh, the other side looks like this. And when I say romantic, um, you know, it's the Royal Pavilion, it's romantic and it's picturesque. It is the ultimate romantic and picturesque building. It means it's meant to entice you, it's meant to surprise you. It's not like one of those Baroque palaces where you just walk to the front door and you know where it is. You have to find your way to it. So, would you like to come in with me? Okay, so first of all, we have to wind our way in a picturesque manner to the front door, okay, which is um, sort of there's a little pot cochere. All this is John Nash, of course. And then we go in, and we see this. And um, this is, you know, an 1820s aqua tint, and this is how it looks today. And you think, OK, this is still what you would expect, you know, sort of the pale, sort of, you know, very, very pale pinks, and then there's sort of a, a, a muted green. But we have lanterns and bells instead of, instead of chandeliers. So it's beginning to look exotic already. And then you go in here. And this is sort of the waiting area. This is, and remember, this was a pleasure palace. This is where George would entertain, where rules were relaxed. It wasn't quite informal, but it was certainly less formal than the London court. Great place to get away from, uh, to get away to, from away from his strict father. So this is where guests were waiting for him, for the king or the prince regent to come down and greet him. And it's quite a disorienting space because you don't quite know what is where, are we outside, are we inside. And of course all these exotic things along the walls and on the walls. And can you see that figure? Like the figure in his mother's room in uh, Queen's house when he was a little boy, a nodding Chinese figure. And if you think this is spectacular, um, you would then be taken into one of the two, uh, one of the three state rooms. It's the one at that end, which you can just see there, at the end is this. Okay, this is the banqueting room. This is one of the John Nash extensions. And it is just, you know, a fantasy vision version of China or what European designers thought of China. None of the, the architect, none of the architects, none of the interior decorators, and, and certainly not George, had ever been to the Middle or the Far East. So all of this was, you know, a European creation. And in this room, the most amazing object is that chandelier in the center. And you can see George sitting there on the right in the middle. This is called promiscuous seating. It is seating not according to rank, but boy, girl, boy, girl. So he could choose any woman he liked to sit next to him. Yeah, promiscuous seating. So lavish banquets would be held there. This is that fantastic, stupendous chandelier which is nine meters long. It's a Perry chandelier <laughs> uh, designed by Robert Jones and is held in the claws of this dragon, which is supposedly Chinese, but actually, if you look carefully, it looks nothing like a Chinese dragon. This is a Welsh dragon. <laughs> it's a Welsh <laughs> dragon. It's an absolutely stunning, stunning object. Um, and recently, 
I had the pleasure of explaining what this chandelier and the whole room is all about to these guests. Oh, I was waiting for to show you. Um, so, uh, mm, so this was in October, and they, so the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, having been made Duke and Duchess of Sussex, came and visited at fairly short notice, and uh, that's me there having to explain chinoiserie and Orientalism in four minutes. Yeah, so. Uh, it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful, and I, I, I'm hoping they're going to sort of come back on a regular basis. So, but it was a challenge, you know. Um, this is the corresponding room at the other end, and this is the music room, and this is another one of George's loves. And we don't have time for that today. But apart from wine, women dancing, architecture, furniture, uh, dressing up, and so on, he loved music. He was known to be playing the piano a little bit. Uh, to sing, and he would hold lavish, wonderful balls in uh, the new uh, Chinese-looking uh, music room of the Royal Pavilion. And he also introduced or encouraged people to dance a rather sexy, promiscuous dance, new fro over from Germany, the waltz, of course. Yeah, where you dance quite closely with one person. So, and here he is on the left there with his favorite ladies again. It's the most astonishing room. You walk into it and you think, you have walked into a lacquer cabinet, which was, of course, you know, some of the export ware that was coming from China with the East India companies. But here, what looks like lacquer is actually painted canvases on the walls. Quite astonishing. And look at those upturned, you know, lilies, uh, umbrella-shaped chandeliers, rather wonderful. Uh, here they are today. And there on the right, you see how it's made to look like lacquer, but it's actually painted with very, very expensive pigments. Uh, and so several sort of layers of pigments and glazes as well. Very strong colors, uh, creating an illusion of the Orient, a party palace. And then there's the central room, and this is really interesting. This is the saloon. It's one of the other great state rooms, and here it is in its last royal manifestation from about 1823. Quite a regal look. And this was almost completely barren for a long, long time. Um, uh, this is what it looked like about 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And the reason why it looked so barren, uh, I'll come to that in a minute, but we, we basically lost all the interiors of this building in 1850, all of them. We had the shell of the building and nothing else. Everything left the building. A lot of things came back. But uh, here we have wonderful Chinese wallpaper, export wallpaper, hand painted. These are wonderful bird and, and flower um, uh, designs. And we took those down because they were never in that room. They were in the building, but not in the room. And we were trying to recreate uh, the room as it looked in the 1820s, um, which meant replacing what was silvered wallpaper. So you see a little bit of the strip there on the right. And it looks completely black. That's a bit of the original 1823 wallpaper, uh, wall decoration, I should say. Uh, of course, all the silver had gone black. So we were trying out to replace it. And we thought, well, if we replace it with silver again, it'll just tarnish again. So what you see there is platinum leaf. So 16,000 platinum leaf motifs were applied by Norman and Anne. This is Norman, uh, both uh, you know, uh, delayed their retirement for this project. Because this was open just a few weeks before Meghan, Meghan and Harry came. So here he is um, recreating uh, the silvered wall decorations. And then the other great element of that room is, of course, the uh, geranium red silk. Here it is. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, made by Humphreys Weaving in England. But uh, how did we get to this? We had the visual evidence, and we had this much of the original left this big this big. And from that, and with a lot of research by Annabel West and other people, we created this wonderful geranium and gold silk. Do you want to have a look at it? Can pass it up. It's a very, very, ex <laughs> it's a very expensive piece of silk. <laughs> but here we here you see it being hung. Um, so what other element is missing? Well, we, so we had the silk, we had the silver, we were regilding everything. What about the carpet? Look at the carpet. The original Axminster carpet had a color scheme of 25 different colors. It was knotted, hand knotted. We couldn't do that. We would have had to send it to China. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to keep it in the country. 
So we actually gave it to Axminster. You know, it's not the same company, but in the same place. And they wove it for us. The most expensive part was actually designing it. So here you see it on the loom. And because the loom can only take 12 colors, 12 strands, so it's a color scheme of 12 instead of 25, but it's a, it's a pretty good compromise. Do you want to see it? Do you want to see the complete room? This is what Megan and Harry saw. This is part of the reason why they came. Here it is. So if you want to get an understanding of George's taste, <laughs> this is George. You know, more is more. More is more, George. And um, um, there, is a, there is a chamber floor, and we don't have time to do this now, but just it continues. Even the small sort of, you know, rooms on the chamber floor uh, were, you know, created, were decorated in this oriental style. A, bit, a lot of Chinese, some Indian, some Egyptian, a lot of neoclassical elements thrown in, in these really highly saturated colors. Some of them brand new pigments, such as the yellow here, chrome yellow had only just become available. So George has, of course, a whole suite of rooms decorated in chrome yellow. And I had a picture taken of myself with a school bus here, because that's chrome yellow, of course. Yeah, yeah, brand new pigment at the time. So, and even in the kitchen, even in the kitchen, you have exotic elements. So the supporting columns are decorated with, as, you know, they look like palms, OK? So by 1823, the building was finished the way George wanted it to look. He was by then king. He was in his 60s. He was ailing. He was suffering from gout and a lot of other ailments related to you know, eating too much, drinking too much, not looking after himself. So you see him here <laughs> as mm, uh, a fat mandarin sitting on a teapot spouting public money, lots of building projects. You know, he's got his Chinese servants. Uh, that sort of snake-like figure there, um, uh, you know, is, is looking a bit like one of the ornaments in the pavilion. Uh, the smoke out of his pipe forms the letter C. That's Lady Cunningham, his, his mistress in the 1820s. Behind him, the craziest of his building projects, the World Pavilion. And he's stroking a, stroking a giraffe. So strangely, after 1827, having enjoyed his... John Nash version of the pavilion for three or four years, he stops coming. He retreats to Windsor, to Windsor Great Park, to a relatively small cottage orné, the Royal Lodge. And what does he do there? Well, he plays with his giraffe. And I'm not, hmm, I'm not saying this was the only reason, but I'm saying it's one of the reasons why he never returned to Brighton. He was really overweight. He couldn't move much anymore. Uh, and he was given the first living giraffe in England by the Pasha of Egypt, and he kept her at Windsor Great Park, so he could sort of go there in his pony chaise and stroke her every day. So this didn't happen here. He wasn't riding the poor giraffe. Uh, but you know, here he is with Lady Cunningham in his, and his latest toy when he should have been looking after the country. Uh, but again, as a great patron of the arts, he commissioned this fabulous, fabulous painting by Jean-Jacques Laurent Agasse of the giraffe in, um, in England. Giraffe, the giraffe doesn't live for very long, has problems with her legs, as does George, so they're quite often sort of compared, and they're both strange creatures, aren't they? Nobody really understands them. Uh, so the giraffe dies uh, late in 1829, and George dies um, just six months later at Windsor. And the other thing he was doing at Windsor, not just playing with his giraffe, he was overseeing the transformation of Windsor Castle. And we don't really think about that when we look at Windsor Castle. We think of the great medieval castle. But actually, lots of what, a lot of what you see at Windsor is George's work. You know, he added sort of, you know, an extra story to the White Tower. He crenellated large parts of it. So he hired Geoffrey Wildwell to do that and was overseeing that from his sort of lodge in Windsor Great Park. And this is where he dies in 1830. And when he died, the Duke of Wellington said this about him. He was indeed the most extraordinary compound of talent, wit, buffoonery, obstinacy, and good feeling. In short, a medley of the most opposite quali qualities that I ever saw in any character in my life, but with a great preponderance of the good. And, you know, he wasn't without sort of self-awareness. He said about himself, I am a different animal, a different being from any other in the whole creation, that my feelings, my disposition, my nature 
In short, all and everything that is me is in all respects different and makes me frequently quite a different animal, um, uh, a different being to any other that either is now, that has, or in all probability that ever will exist in the whole universe. And that's, this may sound a bit sort of, you know, um, he's a bit full of himself, but actually I think he was well aware of the bubble he lived in and how he could never really get out of it. But we do owe him a lot. Um, and just as a postscript, if you have five minutes, uh, you wonder what happened to his pavilion by the sea. Who would possibly want that building? Well, William quite liked it, his brother. But when he dies, Queen Victoria inherits it, and she doesn't like it. <laughs> she really doesn't like it. It's not right for her. And Victoria builds this, and this is now what you see from the Mall. Uh, of Buckingham Palace. The facade now looks a bit different, but this is built in 1846. Victoria, you know, sort of closes off the wonderful Nash design of Buckingham Palace. She needs more space. And she also needs to somehow sort of furnish that space. So she sells the Royal Pavilion, the entire estate, and she takes everything inside with her. And she <laughs> recreates the Royal Pavilion with Albert, of course. Albert was very into colorful interiors. And just to show you a few examples, you might think you're in the Royal Pavilion. You're actually in Buckingham Palace, OK? So there are, there's one of the chandeliers. There's the fireplace from the music room. There's the overdoors from the banqueting room, the paintings from the banqueting room, the chairs, the uh, Orléans vases here on the left from the music room. And there's the toys. You know, this is Victoria's children playing in that room. Here's the one at the other end of Buckingham Palace of that wing, the yellow room. And there we have another fireplace. There we have the pagodas from the Royal Pavilion and lots of vases, wonderful Weissweiler -like cabinets, all so recycled, really. This is the central room, the famous balcony room. I don't have a better picture of this. So you see, again, the chandelier. So spot the Royal Pavilion. Okay, there it is. <laughs> There's one of the music room chandeliers. But Victoria gave many, many things back. So, you know, when you come to the Royal Pavilion, if you come, um, many, many things are original because they came back under Victoria and other monarchs. But that one is still there. Uh, another one here. This is uh, Swanell's official Diamond Jubilee portrait of Her Majesty and Prince Philip. And again, you think you're in the pavilion, but they're in Buckingham Palace. And then my favorite one is this. <laughs> this is Her Majesty getting ready for a photo shoot. And you see this is the, the saloon fireplace, which we're not getting back because it's a you know, inbuilt structure now at Buckingham Palace. But also look at the walls there, the Chinese wallpaper. And uh, it's very nice because when I saw this exhibition, I looked at the whole exhibition, of course, here. And I looked at this. And I had never noticed this before. Look what's in the background. This is the Chinese wallpaper from the Royal Pavilion, yeah, which was, a lot of it was taken down, some of it came back. We have enough, but it's still in Buckingham Palace, and this is where Diana was painted for this portrait. So, I hope you will all visit me at the Royal Pavilion, and I have something else to tell you, and this is brand new information. It's extremely, extremely exciting. So, Victoria took everything. We got a lot of things back, but not everything. And, uh, uh, that wing that Victoria built was quite shoddily built and needs to be rewired. It's now 170 years old and it has just been completely decanted. And that's what the royal family is calling it, the decanting of the east wing of Buckingham Palace. And as we know, it is full of things from the royal pavilion. So this was the press release. Notice that, was, that went live two days after Meghan and Harry's visit that all of these objects are leaving Buckingham Palace and a lot of them are coming back to us. So I've got my work cut out because this year, so if you come after September, we will have the pagodas back, we will have the only on vases, we will not have the fireplaces, but we'll have any number of absolutely extraordinary objects, all of them commissioned, bought, designed, you know, by George IV back in the Royal Pavilion for about three years, including things that what we've asked for, I've asked for this, it's my favorite object because I think it completely sums up the Royal Pavilion, the Regency period, George's tastes. Um, and uh, this is currently, it's, it's from the Royal Pavilion, but it is currently at Windsor Castle, but we have put it on our wish list and we are getting it back.
So there you go. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'm very, very happy to answer any questions. I would like you all to visit me at the Royal Pavilion in Brighton. Thank you very much. God, how was that timing-wise? Was, was that okay? Um, are there any questions right now? Otherwise, come and ask Alexandra. Um, uh, as you leave, but um, thank you very much for a most wonderful lecture. Thank you. I have some newsletters from the Royal Pavilion if you want to pick up some things. I have some here if you're interested.